All right, hi guys, and welcome back to this episode of The Sounding Board, the video segment where I take your questions and answer them. So this question comes from Trigush or Trigush, and he wrote in uh, an email on uh, jlbproductions.com, and his question is as follows. Dear Bruno, I watch your channel a lot and have learned quite a lot regarding live mixing and professional audio fundamentals. I wanted to know how you would go about EQing and mixing electronic drum pads such as the Yamaha DTX-12 and Roland SPD. Most of these instruments just give you a stereo output, so gaining a frequency for the kick will also add low end to the snare. Similarly, for portable keyboards where the player would keep changing instruments during parts of the song. I hope you understand my question. Sorry for the trouble. Thank you, Trigush. So no problem at all. I enjoy helping people and that's the reason that the channel was set up in the first place. Okay, so let's discuss these drum pads. So Yamaha DTX-12, Roland SPD or the like. Uh, most of these do not give you individual outputs, right? Um, the higher end uh, electronic drums like the Roland V-drums or the D-drums, they will actually give you one output per drum. So it's very much like a normal drum kit except it's electronic. So you'll have an output for snare, for kick, for each individual rack tom, for the overheads, etc. With these smaller units, they don't really have space to give you that kind of output, plus the fact that the pads are programmable, right? So they may be a conventional drum kit, they may be congas, timbales, whatever. So as a result, all you have is a stereo left-right output. So you have an issue there in that you cannot balance the signal once it comes out of the unit. So the first step is you need to work with the player to balance the individual pads within the unit. So do a bit of research, go into the owner's manual and find out how to adjust the level of each individual pad. So something like the Yamaha DTX-12 I think has eight or 12 pads. Go and find out how exactly to adjust the relative volume of the pads. Now, once that is done, make sure that you are using a high quality direct box. So in this case, you can use a stereo passive direct box, something like the Radial Pro D2 or two high quality mono DI boxes. Running the signal for these units in stereo helps quite a lot because it helps to spread the instruments out um, across the loudspeakers and it sounds a bit uh, more natural. Now, we know that in live sound, not everyone sits in the middle and a lot of the time people can only hear the sound from one speaker, but you know it's important to use all the tools that we have available to us to achieve the best quality sound. So then when it comes to actually EQing them at the mixer, once again, you may be able to EQ them in the pad unit itself. So that's some research that you have to do on your own because it'll be specific to the unit that you're dealing with. Um, in terms of the EQ on the mixer, I usually just set it flat because as you say very correctly, any attempt to EQ one part of the signal will compromise the tone in another part, right? So if you boost 80 hertz, um, you'll end up getting a muddy snare drum and floor tom as well as the, the kick drum, okay? So not a lot that you can do once the signal comes out of those units. So you have to try and get the best possible balance and tone using the software that's built into these units. Now, let's move on to keyboards, all right? Now, um, keyboards, wow. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm not a keyboard player, all right? I love keyboard players. I'm not a keyboard player. So let me preface this section by saying that. Um, to begin with, 
it is quite important that you do try and run keyboards in stereo as well, okay? And the reason for that is, once again, um, it allows you to spread the signal out, okay, across the stereo sound field. The other thing is that what do you do when you have multiple keyboards, okay? Um, he says here, what, what do you do when the player keeps changing instruments? What about when the player keeps literally changing which keyboard they play on, right? So um, most keyboard players will be satisfied with two, right? They'll be satisfied with a stage piano and a synth. So the stage piano does all the piano-y type stuff, and the synth does the organ stuff, the strings, the special effects, the brass, all of that, okay? So hopefully it will mean that you need no more than four channels for the keyboards, right? Two for the stage piano and two for the synth. Okay, now let's talk about what to do with the different voicings, all right? Now, uh, as you probably have learned from experience, the voicings can differ tremendously in terms of their relative levels. So very often an organ patch will be a lot louder than a keyboard patch and so on. So the solution to this is to work with a player and I will typically identify the, the softest patch, which typically is one of the piano type patches, unless the guy is really a banger. Anyway, so you identify the softest patch and for that, you agree that the keyboard volume will be maxed, okay? Um, the reason for this is, again, that you need to establish a limit to the volume. So, the softest patch level will be maximum on the keyboard, all right? Uh, it can be anything as long as you keep track of it. Then, when the keyboard player switches to another patch, what you will do is you will have them turn the volume down to a level that you agree and work out beforehand, right? So let's say that the organ patch, um, if the piano patch is good at 10, then the organ patch maybe would be at, um, you know, six or seven, and the brass patch might be at like five or something like that, okay? Um, this is the best way of going about this because it builds relationship with the keyboard player and it, it, it helps them to learn about how live sound works, right? The idea being that, you know, we are looking here for balance. If they have one patch that's nice and soft and another patch that's way louder, it upsets the mix when they switch, all right? Now, uh, not all keyboard players will have the wherewithal to do this. So in the case of those, um, what you do is you need to use either a compressor or limiter to basically put a limit on the level of the keyboards. And sometimes that's just what you have to do. There's no choice because either they don't have time to do this or um, there just is, um, th there's um, a lack of uh, communication right, between the keyboard player and the sound engineer. EQ for keyboards, again, I tend not to EQ them very much at all. Um, I'll add a high pass filter because in a band where there's bass guitar, uh, electric and acoustic guitars, the mid range is very, very crowded. So typically what I'll do is I'll make the keyboards real bright and I'll have the keyboard sit above the electric guitar and below the acoustic guitar. Again, it depends on the kind of band, right? If you're um, mixing for Elton John, you better well not high pass his piano too much, right? He'll fire you, <laughs> all right. Um, but yeah, anyway, hope that's answered your question. Uh, thanks very much for writing in. And if you have a question, let me know, either in the comments section of any video, on Facebook, or on my website, glbproductions.com. This is Bruno Luce, and thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.